let's bow our hearts with a word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for this opportunity that you've placed before us, for we know that there are no accidents, no coincidences in your kingdom, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. So we do pray, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives this evening. We pray, Father, that you would reignite in each of us a new hunger, a new appetite, a new awareness of your word. And help us, Father, to understand more clearly just what it is you would have of us personally in the days that remain as we commit ourselves this evening without any reservation into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, we are studying the book of Revelation. We are in the sixth session, and we'll be exploring specifically the last part of chapter 2, which has a letter to the church at Thyatira. But, we have, but just by way of uh, review and warm-up, we're talking about the, the revelation. Notice that's singular. The word means the unveiling. It's the, it's the consummation of all things. It's the only book of the Bible that promises a special blessing to the reader for its particular uh, uh, reading or hearing. And uh, there are over 400 verses, 404 verses, that include over 800 allusions from the Old Testament. And tonight's going to be a good example of several of those. And that's one reason it may sound strange to us. If we read the book, it may sound strange to our ears because we haven't done our homework in the Old Testament for, in a large measure. And so it also represents the climax of God's plan for man. And man, you know who that is? That's you and me, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Man, if you will. It has a, a climax. It's going to lay out for you and me personally the climax that's ahead of us. Now, to whom was the book given? Let's keep this in front of us. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto whom? Unto him, Jesus Christ. That shocks many people. Many people just slough over that first sentence. It's profoundly significant. And why did he give it to him? To show unto his servants things which must shortly, or more, perhaps more precisely, suddenly come to pass. And he sent and signified it. He rendered it into signs by his angel and to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ of all the things that he saw. John actually saw these things. And, uh, but they are signs. One of the most profound experiences I had as a teenager when I heard a lecturer say that the entire book of Revelation is in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the Bible. And one of the reasons it's such a blessing, if you study it carefully, it takes you virtually into every other book in the Bible. So that's part of what we're about. And here's the promise. Verse 3 is the promise that's echoed several times throughout the book. Blessed is he that readeth and he, they that hear the words of this prophecy. The landscape is littered with so-called experts and very prominent people in the Christian field who say this isn't prophecy, it's all been fulfilled. And uh, so it's making, uh, you know, I, could, I obviously take exception to that. So, and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. And this book is one of the unique uh, books in the Bible that gives you an outline of the book. By the time you get to the, close to the end of the first chapter, there is an outline. John has said, write the, is told, write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta after these things. And the things which thou hast seen by the time you get to here is the, the personal appearance of Jesus Christ, his vis physical description that occupies verse 12 through 18 in this chapter. So by the time you get here, those are things we, he, had, he had just seen. Write the things which you have seen. And the things which are, which will turn out to be chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters of seven churches. These are seven letters written to seven real live existing churches um, in the province of Asia Minor, the Roman province of Asia Minor, which we would call Turkey. But these seven churches, what, what we're going to focus on. And then the things which shall be metatauta after these things. And chapter 4, verse 1 opens with that word, metatauta, after these things. And then we have chapters 4 and following, which are yet future. Very interesting book in total, but the area of the book that's most profoundly significant to you and me is chapters 2 and 3. And that's why we're going, to, we're going to spend a full session on each of those seven churches. And uh, so this is, this is the core of the whole thing. We believe that the rest of the book we will watch from the mezzanine. And I'll show you about why when we get to chapter 4. Then the, the chapter 1 closes, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars of the angel of seven churches, the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. 
Just as an example, the chapter closes where Jesus himself explains a couple of the signs that had been, that emerged earlier in the chapter. That's going to be the pattern throughout the book. More often than not, the book will explain the signs you're going to watch. Others, it relies on you doing your homework in the, in the rest of the Bible. Now, seven churches. The great mystery that you need to think about yourself is why these seven churches? There were over 100 churches in the New Testament period. Why these seven? And uh, each letter has a strange phrase that is sort of the closing uh, uh, signature on the letter. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That occurs seven times here, of course, because seven churches, but it also occurs seven times elsewhere in the New Testament. So I'll leave that with you to search that out. It's kind of fun. There are at least four levels of application of these letters. First of all, they were local, local churches. Sir William Ramsey researched this. They, much to his surprise, he discovered that these seven churches really had uh, relevance. In ter the letter had relevance to them in that first century. But there's more than that. The Holy Spirit says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. Every letter applies to every church. We're going to be talking about different churches, the, the seven letters, but you need to recognize that every church here described is also existent in every church. You may have, two teaspoon, tea, you may have a teaspoon of Ephesus, a tablespoon of Smyrna, and a whole diet. In other words, you have, if you took each church, you could take a percentage of each one, adding up to 100%. There's going to be some percentage of every church and every, uh, of the seven churches in each of your churches. So it's a, it's a way of profiling any church. It also says, he that hath an ear... How many of you have earlobes? Can I see a show of hands? That letter is for you then. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this means there is a personal application. No surprise. As we understand each letter, we'll be able to... It doesn't take a lot of spiritual insight to begin to apply it to ourselves. Um, so that's uh, um, pretty straightforward. One of the things we're going to discover is that each of the letters has a specific theme. It isn't as if all the churches were guilty of the same mistakes. Each one had a slightly different mistake or, or a need, need of correction. These are, these are going to be seven report cards. Every report card has something good. Here's what you've done well. Here's what you need to work on. And each one is different. Part of the, the mastery of this series is to understand the theme that's operative in each of the seven letters. But then comes a surprise. Having said all that, it's easy to visualize seven letters. Each one did some good things, needed some correction, and we can apply that to our churches. We can apply it to ourselves personally. No problem. Here's the surprise that may shock you. And it's also an area that not all scholars agree. You draw your own conclusions. But it turns out that these seven letters lay out a history of the church in advance. Now, you say, Chuck, that's pretty wild. Yes, it is. Is that true? You decide yourself. We're going to look at what the letters say, and we'll take a look at history, and I, I'm going to predict you'll be astonished at how they fit. In fact, if they were in any other order, this would not be true. So I believe that order is deliberate and is instructive. There are seven elements to each letter. First of all, the name of the church will turn out to be significant. The title that Jesus uses of himself to open the letter is selected from chapter 1. There's seven different titles, but he picks a different one for each church. The title that Jesus takes of himself, the emphasis, in other words, is a clue that will help you understand what is the issue with that particular letter. So it's, it's, this is going to be like a little treasure hunt here. Then there's a commendation. Here's the good stuff. Here's what you've done well. Well done. Here, here, here. Here's my concern, he'll, Jesus will say. Here are the things that Jesus is not so pleased about. Then there's, of course, from all of that, an exhortation. Do this and do this and do this. Then there's a promise to the overcomer. The letter includes a special promise to the person, to the one that's an overcomer. We'll talk about what an overcomer is in a minute. And then we have this closing phrase. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to churches. You need to recognize there are these seven elements because in a couple of places, one or two of these elements will be missing. And you wouldn't notice it unless you're sensitive to the structure of each letter. And that's also a clue as to what's really going on here. 
So the first letter we was Ephesus, which means the desired one or darling. And we, uh, uh, talked, we understood that they were very strict on doctrine. They good, that was the good news. But they had lost their first love. God wants, Jesus Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ wants devotion, not just doctrine. But we notice as we went through that something very strange that the promise of the overcomer in the book of, to, to the letter uh, uh, Ephesus was appended after the closing phrase. It was like a PS on it, if you will. When we get to Smyrna, Smyrna means myrrh, or it speaks of death, and of course it turns out to be the persecuted church. And again, it has that same structure that the promise of the overcomer is outside the body of the letter for some strange reason. But if we look carefully, we notice there were no concerns. Jesus simply encouraged them because they were a church under great persecution. He just says, hang in there, guys. He had no particular concerns. Pergamus, which, means, uh, which refers to uh, a perverted marriage, um, uh, we, we talked about last time. I'll review a little bit of that as we get into the, the, tonight's thing. But uh, there again, we discover that the promise of the overcomer is appended outside the body of the letter. Why am I making such a thing of that? Because you're going to discover in the letter tonight and all the ones following, it doesn't do it that way. What does that mean? Don't know yet. We'll just hold it in reserve as we go. The prophetic profile, we said here are the seven churches, Ephesus, Myrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, and so on. And Ephesus was descriptive of the apostolic church. That seemed to fit. Smyrna, clearly the persecuted church. That one was pretty easy. Pergamos was the, where the church married the world. What Satan could not accomplish by persecuting the church, he accomplished by having the church marry the world under, under uh, Constantine and all of that. So, and the, we noticed there were terror sown in the early church. We talked about legalism, the denial of God's complete, uh, Christ's completed work. Gnosticism, the denial of Christ's humanity. And Caesar worship, the denial of Christ's lordship. These are the main uh, frailties, if you will, in, that early century, in those early centuries. There's also one that was mentioned in the letter last time, but in reviewing my notes I realized I may not have emphasized it, and that's the Nicolaitans. And uh, what were they? The Nicolaitans, some are, believe it was a first century sect that abused the, their liberty in Christ. There are scholars that so, uh, conjecture that was the, that's what it was. More than that, most scholars recognize that it's an untranslated word. Nikeo means to conquer or rule. The laos means the, uh, the people, the laity. And the whole idea of Nicolaitans was to rule over the people. And... Uh, that's what Christ hated. And he told the, in the church of Ephesus, the good news is you also hate the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And we, we suspect that in either case, the Nicolaitans refers to the whole idea of using a clerical structure to rule over the people and to, to seek apostolic authority for their opinions of the early times. And so Jesus told us how to organize a church. He had the leader wash the feet. That's his concept of an org chart is in John 13. Now the deeds that were hated by the Ephesus and they get commended for that became the doctrine in Pergamos as part of that whole episode. So uh, we see a progression, progressive there. As we talked the application of all churches, Ephesus obviously was devotion, not just doctrine. Smyrna was just hang in there and endure, endure the persecution. Pergamos, stand fast against the world, is what they should have done. Rather than not be part of the world, but to be a witness to the world. And uh, personal application. Ephesus, again, it's a question of neglected priorities, personally. Where are our priorities? Do, are we so busy, busy on the business of the king that we have no time for the king? Jesus would have devotion, not just doctrine. And Smyrna, uh, trying to apply that personally, just be sensitive to the, the, the satanic opposition. You don't have to be in a persecuted church to be persecuted. And... Uh, and Pergamos, of course, was a whole issue of spiritual compromise with the world again. So, and the overcomer's promise, we had various special promises, promised to the overcomer, and we'll talk about that as we go. Well, that's by way of review. Let's just jump into tonight's letter. And what I'm going to do, uh, I'm gonna, we'll put the letter on the screen before we go through. But before we do anything else, let's get your Bible, and let's read chapter, Revelation chapter 2. Like all textbooks, the answers are in the back. That's what Revelation is all about. And uh, so let's pick it up about verse, um, chapter uh, 2, verse 18 to 29. And to the angel of the church at Thyatira write, 
These, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I gave her a space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which serveth and reigneth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works." But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, uh, rod of iron. as vessels of a potter shall they be broken into shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So that's the, it's the longest of the letters, brief as it is, it's still the longest of the bunch. And uh, let's uh, take a look at the geography. We're dealing, of course, with the, pro the proconsular a province of Asia, which is a Roman province, not Asia like we use the term Far East. We're talking what you and I would consider as a part of Turkey. And I've got on the map here, you see where I put Athens and Istanbul on there for just reference. The little red circle is Patmos. That's where all this is taking place with John. Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos we looked at before. Thyatira is a small um, town today. About uh, 30,000 people live there. And uh, it, it, occupy, uh, the, the, it occupies a site that Thyatira originally did back in the New Testament times. In the New Testament times, it was at the juncture of three roads that led to Pergamos, Sardis, and Smyrna. And so it was a frontier fortress to guard those very critical roads. So originally, it was a Lydian town bearing the name of Pelopia, then Semiramis, and then Euhippia. And here's the clue. The word Thyatira really come is a word that means daughter. But what's really a clue to its spiritual significance is to recognize that its previous name, one of its previous names, was Semiramis. And who was Semiramis? Anyone? The consort of Nimrod, the mother of the posthumous son of Temes, that becomes the core trio, Nimrod, Semiramis, and Temes, in the Babylonian mysteries. All paganism, all idol worship has its roots in the Babylonian legends having to do with Nimrod, Semiramis, and Temes. So the fact that this town is a town that once held the name of Semiramis, I think is a very important clue. In any case, it was taken by the Persians and then, of course, the Greeks under Alexander. It ultimately passed to the possession of one of his key generals, Lysimachus. And the, but in 301 B.C., Lysimachus was defeated by his rival, Seleucus, another one of, when, you know, when Alexander died, four key generals divided up the empire. And so it became really part of Syria. And uh, uh, Seleucus Nicator uh, named it Thyatira when he was informed that a daughter had been born to him. So the word Thyatira suggests daughter, but I think the more important name is the previous name that it had earlier, Semiramis. Let's keep that in mind as we go forward. See, the Babylonian legend, of course, is that Tammuz was born to Nimrod and Semiramis. He's associated with the sun god. He was considered to die at the winter solstice. That's when the, you know, the days get shorter and shorter and shorter. And then he's considered as resurrected as the days get longer. And that was celebrated by burning a yule log in the fireplace and then replacing it with a trimmed tree the following morning. If you want to find the biblical references to that, check out Jeremiah 10. It's astonishing to discover, if you haven't yet, how many of our so-called Christmas traditions all lead, go back to Babylon? The mistletoe, the wassail bowl, uh, and so forth. But let's move on. This is somewhat by way of review. Nimrod founded the original Babylonian religion, and uh, 
uh, Semiramis and Tammuz of Babylon, uh, in other languages. In Phoenicians, they were Ashtoreth and Tammuz, and Isis and Horus of Egypt, Aphrodite and Eros of Greece, or Venus and Cupid of Rome. All this is mapped out in the classical study by Alexander Hislop called The Two Babylons, or a more contemporary version uh, of, of this whole scholarship is by Dave Hunt, A Woman Rides the Beast. And we'll talk a lot about that before our study in Revelation is over. But most people don't realize that the priesthood that was founded in Babylon moved. When Cyrus conquered Babylon, the Babylonian priesthood and the initiates fled and set up shop in Pergamos. We talked about this last time. So the centroid of power ultimately goes from Pergamos to Rome, where it gets at Latin labels and forms the foundation of pagan Rome. We're going to talk a lot about that as we uh, unfold. This. The, the background of Pergamos and Thyatira have much in common, so this, re this review is a double review in a sense. And uh, when Cyrus conquered Babylon, of course, they founded the center at Pergamos, and the king there took the title Pontifex Maximus, which was a religious title. He was the high priest of the Babylonian uh, pagan system. And... Uh, and as it goes to Rome, of course, the, all the Caesars kept that title up until 378 A.D. That's when the Bishop of Rome uh, absorbed that title for himself and, and uh, endured from that point on as, in the bishops. And we'll come back to that. Constantine um, has a strange experience which causes him to, uh, when he takes over the empire, to uh, make um, Christianity no longer illegal. In 325, the Edict of Toleration... He favored Christians at court. He exempted Christian ministers from taxes. He issued a general exhortation to all his subjects to become Christians. He did not make it a state religion. That comes two leaders later. But he does. He's so fed up with the paganism of Rome, he moves the world empire to Constantinople. And uh, we'll talk about the implications of that as we go here. But Constantine is a much maligned guy. Many people, especially Christians, are critical of him. He did a, a, he did a lot of interesting things. He, he, he ceased the gladiator thing. He reduced the killing of unwelcome children. He abolished it. It's amazing, by the way, how many ancient cultures, the Persians, the Romans, others, regarded abortion as a crime because population was their force of strength, and to abort a child was to injure the state. That was their view. Interesting. He, uh, Constantine abolished crucifixion as a form of execution. He repealed the, the persecution edicts of his predecessor, Diocletian. He assumed a headship of the church, advanced Christians to high offices. He declared Sunday as a day of worship. That's widely misunderstood. He had three different groups of sun worshipers in his empire, plus the Christians that are now legal. And so he declared a day that would, presume, in his mind at least, that would unite them all. It was his gesture to try to unite the empire. It was also a big deal for the slaves because he forbid work on Sunday. They never had a day off. This created a day off for, the, uh, for over 50% of the population, which were slaves. And, uh, so, and he reduced slavery and relocated the capital, as I say. So the marriage is now consummated between the church and the world. Julian, the post comes along, the Julian calendar that preceded the Gregorian one. Um, he sought to restore paganism, but he only lasted a couple of years. Jovan reestablished the Christian religion, but it was Theodosius that really established Christianity as the state religion. That was the biggest disaster of all because now you have unregenerate people entering the church and running the churches. So ambition, um, heathenism, and so forth all emerge in, the, in this world church situation. That starts bad news, big bad news. Now, getting back to Thyatira, Thyatira is, turns out to be a very important center for the powerful trade guilds. The trade guilds were a big deal in those days. You had, if you were, had a skill of some kind, in order to have a job, you'd have to be a member of that union. But that union was not only compulsory. They each, were, each union was under the patronage of one, some pagan deity. And all their meetings and procedures were all tangled up in the worship of that deity. So it was a real, a real uh, source of conflict for a practitioner that was Christian because he couldn't get a job unless he was in a trade guild, but in the trade guild it raised all kinds of issues. And that's a problem. Thyatira, by the way, was also known for its dyes, particularly purple, but actually it may turn about, but you always hear purple, it may have been scarlet, but I won't split here, here, here. Uh, it was, uh, apparently they had a matter root that is very prolific in that area. When you get to Acts 16, you encounter Lydia, who is a sales rep living in Philippi, but for, for Thyatira. Just a, you know, she was a, she was a sales rep, okay. So we have heathenism now uh, is, is uh, Christianized. The pagan temples now become Christian churches. The heathen festivals get relabeled uh, into Christian ones. That's how the uh, Saturnalia and so forth becomes Christmas and all that stuff. 
pagan priests slip into office as Christian priests. The change was mostly nomenclature. See, what the persecution didn't accomplish with Smyrna, did, the, the marriage to Pergamus did. And we're going to see the fruits of that as we get into Thyatira. Let's take a look at the letter now in more detail. Under the angel of church in Thyatira write. And again, starting with the name, Semiramis is the key name here in my mind because it ties you to the Babylonian culture. you see why we're going to get into that here in a minute. Thus saith the Son of God. This is the only mention of the Son of God, that title in the book of Revelation. Jesus picks it here. And I'm going to suggest the possibility is that it's in apposition to the theme of the letter, which is going to be the queen of heaven with Jezebel and all of that. Thus these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now when you see the word like, that tells you it's a simile. It doesn't say his feet were brass. If he said that, it would be maybe a metaphor. But here it says like, so you know it's not brass. It's, it's a metaphor. It's a uh, simile. His eyes were like a flame of fire. These are the eyes of inspection. These are the eyes of judgment. His feet like fine brass. Feet deal with the walk. And brass speaks of judgment. Brass was the material that could sustain fire. That's why brass is used Levitically uh, to suggest uh, to judgment. That's why we had a serpent of brass that we talked about in previous sessions and so forth. So the title of Christ is the Son of God. Very strange, strange, illuminating label. That puts us right away. He's, and he apparently is coming in the form of judgment here. He's, he's concerned. But he opens up, as he does all his letters, with a commendation. I know thy works. That's a key phrase. Jesus knows what you're doing. He knows the fruits of what you're doing. I know thy works. Nothing will be a surprise to him. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and patience and thy works. And the last will be more than the first. He gives them a good compliment. He's fully informed on them, and they, their walk is good and improving. We're going to talk about a lot of negative things here shortly. Let's not lose sight of the fact that he opens up with a commendation, okay? And it's not only as a commendation, but it's even, that aspect of it is improving. But there is a problem. Here's his concern. You get that horrible word, notwithstanding. Your boss calls you into his office and says, hey, you've really done a good job. You've done this, this, this. I'm quite impressed. And you feel pretty good. Then he says, notwithstanding. <laughs> Sounds like a pink slip coming, doesn't it? Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that one, that means permits, sufferest that one Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess. Doesn't say she was. It says she called herself one to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now the word fornication obviously speaks of sexual immorality. And that may be at the local level exactly what was going on. But that term is also used throughout the scripture, Old and New Testament, to refer to idol worship. Having intimacy with a false god is fornication in God's eyes. He's a very jealous God. So we've got to recognize that word fornication doesn't exclude sexual immorality, but the term goes far beyond just that. Are we together? Seduced by servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. It's in, now, the, the problem here isn't Jezebel. The problem here is that the church is condoning Jezebel. See, the problem in Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19 was not homosexuality. The problem in Genesis 19 is that the whole town condoned homosexuality. All the men of the, of the town were at that door. It was the widespread condoning of it. There's homosexuality elements of it all the time. No, it's when it's widespread and condoned civically, that's the problem in Sodom and Gomorrah. We're dealing with a similar thing here. The problem isn't Jezebel. It's that they all embrace it. They, they don't do anything about it. Jesus goes on and says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Boy, this is quite a term. First of all, this is the first phrase of this, this first use of this phrase in the book of Revelation, the great tribulation. And what's saying is, if they don't change, they're going to go into the great tribulation. That also implies, by the way, if they do change, they won't. This is heavy implications here. The hard castment, but then they committed out with it in the great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. 
And uh, we could uh, talk a lot about this, but perhaps let's talk a little. Let's, let's understand. We need to, to understand this letter. We need to really understand who is this person Jezebel? What's she all about? Well, she was the daughter of Ethbaal, which was the king of Sidon, the priest of Astarte, the, and he was the murderer of his predecessor, Phalas, whom he killed to seize the throne. So that's, she's, she comes from a rough family. She married King Ahab, the king of the northern house of Israel, married King Ahab to seal a profitable trade alliance between Israel and Phoenicia. The king of Sidon was part of Phoenicia, so it was a, tr it was a commercial deal. But as she marries Ahab, becomes the queen, she sets out to exterminate the prophets of Yahweh, or Yahweh, or Jehovah, however you want to pronounce it. And so she is bad news. If you, and your background here would be to read 1 Kings 18 through 21 to get the background. We'll just highlight some of it here. What she brought to the table was pagan worship. She's a worshiper of Baal and Astarte, which all of which originated in Babylon. So she, along with her husband, ushers in the worst period of time in the Old Testament. And that's saying something. That's saying something. She worshipped Ashtoreth, which is another variation of Astarte. Also associated with all this are what's called the groves. When you read about the groves in the Bible, you may not understand that Jews never had their holy places on the top of a hill. That was always the pagan locations. And on the top of the hill were the groves. You say, what are the, what are the groves? They're trees that were carved to look like phallic symbols. It was part of the pagan worship, the fertility rites, and all of that. And uh, all this, this is all uh, also called the abomination of Sido uh, the Sidonians and so forth. The whole concept of the queen of heaven, incidentally, is a Babylonian concept. And that lurks behind many of these things, and I won't spend a lot of time on that here. But let's give you a, a you, I can't get into Jezebel and Ahab without, and deal with this issue without using it as an excuse to jump in to 1 Kings 18. I don't know how Cecil B. DeMille missed this chapter in the Bible. He made so many movies you know, with Samson and Delilah and David and Bathsheba and, of course, the Ten Commandments. Cecil B. DeMille had a, had a, a thing for this. He missed the, what's got to be one of the most incredible showdowns you've ever seen anywhere. So we're going to just go through it quickly to get a flavor of this because it, it talks about what Jezebel is really all about. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? This is the king's dream. <laughs> Elijah says, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam. Baalim, Baalim here being a plural of Baal, the, the, the false gods. Now therefore, send and gather unto me, Elijah says, all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, there we go, 400, which he just will table. Everybody knows about the 450. They overlooked there's another 400 others. You're talking 850 of these false priests. Elijah says, challenge the king. Bring them all up to Carmel. We're going to have a showdown. So Ahab sent to all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together into Mount Carmel. They came there because the king told them to. Elijah came into all the people and said, how, and he's gathered, the priests are there, but he gathers Israel around. There's a show, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, this is a showtime. Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Nobody said a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it into pieces, lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And call ye upon the name of your gods, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. All the people said, hey, well spoken. Cool deal. Let's get this resolved. Elijah sent the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many. And call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, dressed it, called it, called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon. <laughs> I love this part. This is the case. That Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking or he's relieving himself. That's what the word really means. Or he's in journey or poor adventure. He sleeps, must be awakened. Here's, 
you, you sort of visualize these two guys are two hills. Elijah is just having a field day, mocking them. A little louder. He can't hear you. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's, on, maybe he's going to the john. That, something's wrong. <laughs> and they cried aloud and cut themselves. One of their ways of expressing themselves was to, was to slash and cut and bleed. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blush gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. it. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired. There apparently was an altar that was broken down, was destroyed earlier. So he repairs it. He takes this, puts the stones back up, repairs the altar that was broken down. He took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the Lord, word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Remember when, it, when, when Jacob was given the name Israel. That's, and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now here's something he just introduces. You golfers will understand what he's doing. It's called a handicap, okay? He puts a trench about the altar. He put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood, that is the bullock, and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. He's dousing it with water. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with uh, water. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, how appropriate, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Abram, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, that thou hast turned their heart back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Can you imagine that scene? Oh, man. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. Boy, I can imagine. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon. And what did he do? Kill. He killed them. Didn't mess around. First Kings 18. There's more, but we're going to, just, we're going to move a couple of chapters. There's another incident that is in the Scripture, and I believe there's no incident in the Scripture that isn't there by design. And I believe that the event that we're going to look in First Kings 21 is perhaps the most revealing of all. Let's take a look what happened in 1 Kings 21. It came to pass after all these things, several other things that happened between 18 and, chapter 18 and 21. But anyway, it says, that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. So this little guy, Naboth, got a vineyard. It happens to be convenient for the king. So Ahab spake to Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. So give him a trade or cash. He wants the deal. But then said, Ahab, the Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. This whole concept of land, the land was you know, allocated by tribe, and, and you, didn't, you, you could lease it in terms of letting somebody use it for a while, but you didn't get rid of it. No, he says, I, 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 he wouldn't do that. So Ahab is in a pout. <laughs> Verse 4, Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreel had spoken to him. For it said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed, and he turned away his face and would eat no bread. Just like a spoiled brat, right? Ah, Jezebel. But Jezebel's wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? He said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Jezebel's wife said to him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Jezebel says to the king, don't sweat it. Let me handle it. 
How does she handle it? She wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. She wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Straightforward procedure. The men of the city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. And as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came two men, children of Belial, that set, in other words, devil worshippers in effect, and set before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city, stoned him with stones, that he died. And then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. What is not mentioned here, but is mentioned elsewhere in the scripture, they didn't just kill Naboth, they slaughtered all his heirs, sons and grandsons. So there'd be no claim on the land. Doesn't end there. Doesn't end at verse 14. It came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive but dead. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite and take possession of it. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise and go down to meet Ahab the king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. Very specific, very direct. You know, it really is ridiculous. Here's a king who could have gotten anything he wanted. But here's this little vineyard of this little guy. For that to be an issue, it's just, you know, anyway. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and I will take away thy posterity. I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. You say, what on earth is that about? It's a rather colorful way of saying his male sons and grandsons. In other words, the ones that would inherit. Them that pisseth against the wall. I didn't say that. that King James said that. I'm going to hear about that when I get home. Yeah. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, of son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. For the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and has made Israel to sin. And, and of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. Him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did him sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And on it goes. And he did very abominably in, the follow, in following idols, according to all the things did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, he rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his flesh, and fasted, and lay in sackcloth, and went softly. Naboth's vineyard. The king wants the vineyard. The queen arranges the inquisition, arranges for false witnesses, condemnation, execution, and it's the property is seized for the king. Does that echo something in history? What's it called in history? Anyone? Inquisition. The inquisition. Dark days. What also is that they, they bought the heirs were also slain as indicated. Let's look ahead from 1 Kings into 2 Kings chapter 9 when Jehu, Jehu is quite a guy. I don't have time to get into him tonight. But there is, <laughs> he was uh, quick on the draw here. He also drove too fast. He broke speed limits. But let me go into that here. When Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her face and teared her head and looked out at a window. And as Jehu entered in the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? That's a taunt, by the way, because Zimri had slain his master. And, and uh, anyway, and he lifted up his face to the window. She's up there. And he says, Who's on my side? Who? And they looked out two eunuchs, two officers of the harem there, said, throw her down. So they threw her down. Some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. 
And when he's come in, he did eat and drink. <laughs> she falls there. He runs his horses and chariots over her, so she makes sure she's dead. He goes in and has a, has a bite to eat. <laughs> this is Jehu, right? He said, go see now this cursed woman and bury her, for after all, she's a king's daughter, right? And they went out to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, in the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And uh, the carcass of Jezebel shall be as a dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, this is Jezebel. I forgot to mention that Jehu is with his sidekick. The two of them were servants of Ahab at Naboth's vineyard. So they witnessed the sin of Ahab. But now Jehu is king and his sidekick. They also witness the judgment of Ahab and of Jezebel. Very, very, there's a lot of retribution under, under all of this. But, uh, so Jezebel gets her due. Well, so Jesus is using Jezebel as an idiom here. Uh, apparently, I assume that there was a literal Jezebel of some kind there in the church in Thyatira, but I think it's something far deeper that's coming on here. He says, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts, or the minds and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. It's interesting, this sort of already starts to imply that there is a remnant in Thyatira that may survive. The church itself is in big trouble. Here's the exhortation that Jesus says, but, I say, but unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. Now, the deep things of Satan, the depths of Satan, what on earth is that all about? Uh, there's a play on words here because the, the, uh, the deep things of Satan is uh, bathos and the burden is baro. So in the, in the, in there's a, uh, a uh, phonetic similarity in the Greek. But anyway, that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. This is the first place in the seven letters that there is an explicit reference to the second coming of Christ. He says, which you, that which you have already, hold fast, till I come. That till is a very important word. Then we get to, he, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Now he's, he promises that to the overcomer. The context implies that was the ambition of Jezebel, that power over the nations. Don't go that way. Just hold fast to your faith. And keepeth my, he that keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power of the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of potter shall they be broken to shivers. These are all echoes of Psalm 2 and so forth. Even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. This will happen before sunrise. And uh, there, there may be an echo of the star of Jacob that Balaam, the prophet Balaam talks about, but we'll let that one go for here. And then we have, of course, this closing phrase, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit sa says to the churches. This is the first letter where the promise to the overcomer is in the body of the letter. So we have Thyatira, we have the name, we have the, all the elements that we've just gone through. But we notice that unlike the first three, the promise of the overcomer is in the body of the letter as it will be for the coming three ones. There's a change in structure here for some bizarre reason. We'll explore that when we have all the letters in front of us. We've looked at the local. We've, let's talk about the admonitory. How does this apply to churches today? Are there Jezebels in churches today? Well, are there pagan practices in the church today? Absolutely. And we be, we're going to be talking about some specific ones, but let's recognize there are pagan practices in every church you'll walk into. The question is, how much? Find a church that worships on Sunday. You've got Constantine there, not the, not the New Testament. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, don't misunderstand me. But uh, anyone that thinks that uh, Sunday's the Sabbath hasn't done their homework. But that's not a big deal. Paul says, don't let anyone judge you for the keeping of any holy day, Sabbath or Sabbaths. So don't make that a divisive thing. But just understand that, that's a, that, uh, that uh, Shabbat is the seventh day of the week. Sunday isn't. Sunday's the first day of the week. And uh, some people say, well, we worship it because of the resurrection. If that's your argument, fine. We'll leave it lay for now. But let's go on. There are pagan practices. Um, when we talk about Easter, that's, a, that's the golden egg of Astarte. 
And the formula for the Easter calendar was deliberately designed by the churches so it would not fall on Passover. And usually it's close. This year it's strange because of the extra month. But the point is that, that um, there's paganism everywhere, some churches more than others. Okay, we also have a personal thing. Well, that probably fits pretty much all the way through. Again, pagan practices, how do we deal with that personally? And do we need to deal with that? And the overcomer's promises. There's all kinds of promises, but uh, we'll leave that one. Leave that. That's pretty straightforward also. And who is the overcomer? Let's not get into a legal trip here. Who is the First John 5, 4 is your verses. The same author that wrote Revelation wrote a letter, first letter. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's our job. We are a walk by faith, not of works. If you have serious faith, works will be a byproduct. But don't put that cart before the horse or you get into a whole a denial of Christ's completed work. Okay, we've covered three of them. Let's get to the most astonishing one of all, the prophetic side of this. What are these depths of Satan, first of all? Esoteric mysteries of the Babylonian cults, of course. In 378 A.D., Demasus, the bishop of Rome, took the office of Pontifex Maximus. That was the high priest of the Babylonian religion. It previously had been the prerogative of the Caesars. But here he took it on, and that when the Christian church now had as its titular head Pontifex Maximus, the very title from the Babylonian pagan, paganism. But let's get into the papacy. This is the core issue here. Let's review this. And I want to apologize in advance for any of you who are from a Catholic background, because I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going to talk about some history that you may not be aware of. And I'll give you bibliographical references at the end where you can verify this. I do encourage you not to believe a word I say, but to do your own homework. But let's take a look. You will not understand the history of Europe unless you understand the tensions between the Vatican and the various kings of Europe as the Vatican aspired to temporal authority, more than religious authority. The word Pope, of course, simply means Papa or Father. It initially applied to all Western bishops, by the way. About 500 A.D. it began to be restricted to the Bishop of Rome. For 500 years, the bishops of Rome were not popes, by the way. What about Peter? They have a, Roman Catholics promote a tradition that Peter was the first pope. It's fiction. There's no historical basis for this. There's no evidence that Peter was ever a bishop of Rome. In fact, he himself seems to have a foreboding over his successors. In 1 Peter 5, 3, he says, Neither as being lords over the God's heritage, but being examples to the flock is his emphasis. Just the opposite, if you will. And by the way, there are people that argue that we're at Babylon in his second letter, it shows up there as a code name for Rome. That's not true. Babylon was a major Jewish center. In fact, that's where the Babylonian Talmud was compiled. That's all another myth that we'll talk about later in the study, later in the study of Revelation. In the fourth century, there were five major primary centers, Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. They each had the bishop in that area was called a patriarch. All five were originally equal. In 395 A.D., when the empire divides, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria acknowledge the leadership of Constantinople. Not Rome, Constantinople. That's one reason Constantine moved it. But that started a struggle between Rome, pagan Rome, if you will, and Constantinople. And that struggle goes on for quite a while. And uh, the bishop of Rome, in his lust for worldly power, claimed universal jurisdiction over the church. That just, he just asserted it. Unfortunately, that was all, it was his, under his watch, the empire divided into two separate empires, east and west. The Roman Empire itself split into two arms, two legs, if you will. The east, of course, was beset with all kinds of uh, theor uh, theological controversies. The west was under increasingly weak emperors, and it was breaking up before the barbarians. They would fall apart by 476 A.D. The eastern leg outlasted the western leg by a thousand years. But these jawbone attempts, these attempts for the Bishop of Rome to somehow declare that he's in charge of all of them, uh, was attempts that continued to, until Leo I. We want to get to Leo I here. Um, the, uh, in 445, 445, he obtained from the emperor uh, the, the, uh, the imperial recognition for his claim as primate of all bishops. In 452, he did a... Understand the barbarian... Rome was falling apart. The barbarians were at the gates. And... Uh, Attila the Hun, he, he, he persuaded Attila the Hun to spare the city of Rome. 
Pretty cool. I mean, he, he pulled that off. Uh, in 455, a few years later, uh, uh, Gennesaret, the Vandal, uh, he did the same thing. He talked him into having mercy on the city. These jawbone attempts, these, these, these di di diplomatic moves really earned Leo I his, his reputation. He had it made. So he declared himself Lord over the whole church. He advocated exclusive universal papacy, just following along here, the, the same claims that predecessors had, but in his case, he sort of earned some respect here. And he proclaimed that resistance to his authority was a sure path to hell. These are the kinds of assertions that are starting. They also advocated the death penalty for heresy. So this is starting, this is, these guys are starting to get pretty tough. But we have the fall of Rome. And uh, uh, Simplicius was the Roman pope when the Western Empire came to an end. That's roughly 476 A.D. And uh, now there was no civil authority. All the fragmented kingdoms of the barbarians gave all kinds of opportunities to do deals among them. Uh, and the pope became one of the more commanding figures in the West. Not because of his political authority, just as, as, as a center of influence. Gregory I is regarded by many scholars as the first pope. Others would say Leo was. There's debates in that in various ways. But, but Gregory I was quite a guy. If, um, there, if there had been more popes like him, I think the world would have a whole different estimate of the papacy. He labored unceasingly over the purification of the church. He deposed neglectful or unworthy bishops. He opposed the sale of offices. That's called simony. Um, but let's get to a guy by the name of Charlemagne. Zacharias was instrumental in making Pepin the king of the Franks. The Franks was the uh, Germanic people that occupied uh, western Germany and northern France. And uh, so uh, this pope was instrumental in letting Pepin, Pepin become the king of the Franks. A uh, succeeding pope requested Pepin to lead his army to Italy to conquer the Lombards, which had pillaged Israel, and he did, and he succeeded. And he gave the center core of Italy to the Pope. That became the beginning of the, uh, the uh, papal states, if you will. And that continued, by the way, all the way till 1870 when uh, Italy regained uh, those lands back, all except the Vatican City itself. So they had that for 1,100 years, thanks to, to uh, um, Pepin. Now, the, 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 uh, Pepin has a son by the name of Charlemagne who becomes a major player. And he, was, he turns out to be one of the greatest rulers of all time. That's why we're getting into this a little bit here. But he, was, uh, he reigned 46 years through many wars and incredible conquests. And his realm included Germany, France, Switzerland, Austria, Hungary, Belgium, and parts of Spain and Italy. So that was the so-called Holy Roman Empire, if you will. And he helped the Pope, and the Pope helped him. They had a real duet going here. And uh, he was one of the greatest influences in bringing the papacy to a position of world power. Uh, following the, the traditions. I might mention he's the grandson. Charlemagne was the grandson of Charles Martel who stopped the Moors in 732. That was a big thing in European history. Had Charles Martel, the, the, the Moors were, the, the, were taken over Europe. And uh, at Tours, France, he, he stopped. So Charlemagne is his grandson. So he comes from a very distinguished background. And we get to the Treaty of Verdun. After Charlemagne dies, of course, the Treaty of Verdun divided his empire into what later became the foundation of Germany, France, and Italy. That's where it really came out of, the Treaty of Verdun. But this is where a ceaseless struggle starts between the popes and the, primarily the German and French kings. And uh, the so-called Holy Roman Empire lasted a thousand years until Napoleon brought it to an end in 1806. It's interesting how the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman, but that's the label, um, uh, is sort of the echo of ambition subsequent. Hitler's Third Reich was the third regime. You had the Ro original Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. It was the Third Reich. That was the idea. And uh, uh, so on. And what we're seeing in Europe uh, is heading in a similar direction. Well, we have a st strange thing occur. Um, Nicholas I, by the way, is the first pope to wear a crown. And uh, it was about this time, 857, there a book surfaces called the Isidorian Decretals. And it purported to be letters and decrees of bishops and councils of the second and third centuries. And the whole idea was to, to exalt the power of the Pope, stamping the papacy with the authority of antiquity, and antedating the Pope's temporal power by five centuries. They were very, very important, except after a couple of centuries, they were proven to be forgeries, the most colossal forgeries in history. Deliberate forgeries. forgeries. See, until, 1860, until 869, all these ecumenical councils were held under the auspices of Constantinople. They were in Greek, not Latin. 
we can tend to forget that. But that was really where the, the real issues were joined. And, and Nicholas I undertook to interfere in the affairs of the Eastern Church. He excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople, who in turn excommunicated him, so they, they treated excommunication notes. Um, and uh, the claims of the Roman Church became increasingly unbearable, so the East finally it's, it separates itself. This is called the Great Cleavage, where the, where the Eastern Orthodox separates from the Roman Catholics, if you will. They really, that's where they really split. The Eastern Orthodox um, uh, has many traditions that are similar, but many that are very distinctly different than the Roman Catholics. They don't have celibate priests and so forth. Um, and of course, the breach became, becomes wider through the centuries, and uh, the uh, brutal treatment of Constantinople by the armies of the Pope Innocent II during the Crusades um, deepens the whole uh, division between the two. So there's a huge tension between them. Well, from 904 to 963 is known in history, strangely enough, as the rule of the harlots. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, under Sergius III in 904, there's a gal by the name of Mar uh, Marzoia, Marozia, excuse me, and uh, her mother Theodoria and her sisters. They filled the papal uh, chair with paramours and bastard sons and turned the papal den into a den of robbers. And this is why they call this era called the rule of the, the, the harlots. Um, Sergius uh, the I gets replaced by John the Tenth. He was brought from Ravenna to Rome by, uh, and made pope by Theodora for her more convenient gratification. He was uh, smothered to death by Marozia, who then in succession raised a papacy. Uh, Leo the Sixth, Stephen the Seventh, and John the Ninth, uh, 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 who was her own her own illegitimate son. And. Uh, Another of, her sons was, uh, another of her sons appointed the following popes, Leo VII, Stephen the uh, Eighth, Martin III, and uh, Agapetus the Second. And uh, then we get to John the Twelfth. He was the grandson of Marozia, guilty of almost every crime you can imagine, violated virgins and widows, lived with his father's mistress, made the papal palace a brothel. Um, was killed in the act of adultery by the woman's enraged husband. So this is the legacy that's from that era. But the descent continues. Um, we have uh, Benedict the Eighth and and John the Ninth that bought the office of the probe through bri open bribery. And then Benedict the Ninth was made pope as a 12-year-old boy through a money bargain with the powerful families that ruled Rome. He committed murders and adulteries in broad daylight and robbed pilgrims in, on the graves of martyrs, a hideous criminal. The people drove him out of Rome, and some people call him the worst of all the popes, but that, 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 he'll at least make the finals. Then we have a period of time where there were three rival popes. Benedict IX continued, but Gregory VI and Sylvester III, um, the Rome swarmed with hired assassins, and the virtue of pilgrims was violated, and... Uh, so we get to Clement II, and uh, he was appointed Pope by Emperor Henry VIII of Germany, quote, because no Roman clergyman could be found who was free of the pollution of simony, uh, that is, purchase, buying offices, and fornication. So it's that bad. The king steps in and appoints Clement II to fill the bill. Now we start moving into better days, the golden age of papal power, at least. And uh, there was a cry of reform was uh, answered by Hildebrand, who led the pap papacy into its golden age from 1049 to 1294. And uh, he controlled five successive um, administrations prior to his own. And when he, 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 control he appointed those four, and then he, he uh, became uh, Gregory the, the uh, seventh. And he, took, he undertook a, a major reform. So things are getting better, presumably. We get to Innocent III, however, who may be the worst of the bunch. He was the most powerful of all the popes, by most uh, uh, historians. Um, he claimed to be vicar of Christ and victor of God. He said, all things on earth and in heaven and in hell are subject to the vicar of Christ. This is his phrase. More blood was shed under his direction and that of his immediate uh, successors than any other period of church history, except perhaps the papacy's effort to crush the Reformation in the 16th and 17th centuries. He considered himself the supreme sovereign of the church and the world. All the monarchs of Europe obeyed his will, including the Byzantine Empire. That's astonishing. 
He ordered two crusades. He decreed transubstantiation. He confirmed auricular confession. He declared papal infallibility. He condemned the Magna Carta. That's interesting. Forbade the reading of the Bible in the vernacular. And he instituted the Inquisition. And we can't go very far without understanding a little bit about the Inquisition. Called in, in by the Vatican the Holy Office. The Inquisition was instituted by Pope Innocent III and was perfected by Pope Gregory IX. Everyone was required to inform against heretics. Anyone suspect was liable to torture without knowing the name of his accuser. The proceedings were secret. The inquisitor pronounced sentence and the victim was turned over to civil authorities to be imprisoned for life or to be burned. And his property, the victim's property, was confiscated and divided between the church and the state. Do you understand the insidious incentives here? There's a real incentive here to, you know, to, to, for a guilty verdict, whatever the circumstances are. The Inquisition, of course, claimed vast multitudes of victims in Spain, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands. It did its most deadly work against the Albigenses. Let's talk about them a little bit. They were in southern France, northern Spain, and northern Italy. They preached against the immoralities of the priesthood, the worship of saints and images. They completely rejected the clergy and their claims. They opposed the claims of the church at Rome. They made great use of the scriptures and lived self-denying lives with great zeal for moral purity. Well, that's a formula to get persecuted, isn't it? By 1167, a majority of population of southern France, and, and, they, were, and, and they were very numerous in northern Italy. In 1208, the Pope Innocent III, strange label, isn't it? ordered a bloody war of extermination, which utterly wiped out town after town. The inhabitants murdered without discrimination until all the Albigenses were utterly wiped out. They weren't the only ones. The Waldenses, a similar but not identical group in the same region, emphasizing Bible reading and rejecting uh, clerical usurp usurpation and profligacy, were similarly wiped out. Notice this is well before the Reformation. These are backgrounds that lead, of course, to the Reformation. In the 30 years between 1540 and 1570, no fewer than 900,000 Protestants were put to death by the Pope's war for the extermination of the Waldenses. For 500 years, the Inquisition was the most diabolical thing in human history. Well, we get to Boniface the seventh or eighth, I mean. He, in his famous bull, the uh, Unum Sanctum, he said, quote, We declare, affirm, define, and pronounce that it is altogether necessary for salvation that every creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. That was their style. He was so corrupt that Dante, the famous English author who visited Rome during his pontificate, called the Vatican a sewer of corruption and assigned him, <laughs> along with Nicholas III and Clement V, to the lowest parts of his famous, you know, uh, divi uh, inferno. Yeah, thank you. Then we get to another era that many people don't know about, the French control of the papacy. See, the papacy had been victorious in its 200 years struggle primarily with the German Empire. But they met their match with Philip the Fair, the King of France, with whom the history of modern France begins. The death of Pope Benedict the, uh, the 11th, the papal palace was removed from Rome to Avignon on the south border of France, and for 70 years, the papacy was the mere tool of the French court. Many people don't realize that. For the next 40 years, there were two sets of popes, one at Rome and one at Avignon, each claiming to be the vicar of Christ, hurling anathemas and curses at each other. Then we get to what's called the Renaissance popes, from the, uh, John the 23rd on. And uh, he's, he was called by some the most depraved criminal who ever sat on the papal throne, guilty of almost every crime. As Cardinal Bologna, he was uh, 200 maidens, nuns, married women, fell victim to his amours. As Pope, he violated virgins and nuns, lived in adultery with his brother's wife, was guilty of sodomy and nameless vices, bought the papal office in the first place, uh, sold card and the lights, I guess you call it, uh, to children of wealthy families, and he openly denied the future life. No surprise. And uh, so, and we get to Pope Pius II. Uh, he said to have been the father of many illegitimate children. He spoke openly of the methods he used to seduce women and encourage young men, even offering to instruct them in the methods of self-indulgence. That's quite an example. Paul II filled his house with concubines, we're told. Uh, Sextus IV uh, sanctioned the Spanish Inquisition, decreed that money would deliver souls from purgatory. That's a great way to raise funds. He was implicated in a plot to murder the Lorenzo de' Medici and others who opposed his policies and used the papacy to enrich himself and his relatives. He made eight of his nephews cardinals, while as yet some of them were mere boys, 
in wealth and pomp, he and his relatives surpassed the old Roman families. And we get to uh, Innocent the Eighth. Had 16 children by various married women, multiplied church offices, sold them for vast sums of money, decreed the extermination of the Wallenses, appointed the brutal Thomas of Torquemada as the Inquisitor General of Spain, and ordered all rulers to deliver up heretics to him. Then we have Alexander the Sixth, the most corrupt of the Renaissance popes. These are tough competitions, by the way. None of these guys are. Um, he was licentious, avaricious, depraved. He bought the papacy, made many new cardinals for money, had a number of illegitimate children whom he openly acknowledged and appointed to high church office while they were yet children, and murdered cardinals and others who stood in the way. And then we get to Pius the, uh, the uh, uh, by the way, Alexander IV also had a mistress, of the, had a mistress, uh, a sister of a cardinal who he then made Pope, Pope Pius III. So they all get a piece of the action here. Well, that leads us, that is a background for a young coal miner's son. 1483, he was born, uh, born to a coal miner, a guy by the name of Martin Luther. He was out to become a lawyer when he had an experience in a very violent lightning storm that caused him to pursue a doctorate in theology. Very pivotal time for the world, actually. He went to Rome, and to give you just a short rendering of this, he was so disillusioned that uh, he had been advised uh, when he was, he was very ill on the, going through the Alps to Rome that a, a monk told him to... He, he, he had, Luther, very early in his, in his doctoral studies, became very um, burdened by his own sin. He really couldn't deal with that. In fact, his, his uh, confessor said, stop coming to me until you've got something to confess. I mean, he was just, you know. But he, uh, this, but he uh, the, the, the key to your life is Habakkuk 2.4. He went to Rome, became very disillusioned, but on the way back he realized that's the key to the whole thing. And Habakkuk 2.4 says the just shall live by faith. And that became his life verse. In fact, Paul wrote a trilogy on that verse. Book of Romans, Book of Galatians, Book of Hebrews. Who are the just? That's what the book of Romans answers and quotes that verse. How shall the just live? They shall live by faith. How, how do how you do that? That's what Galatians is all about. The just shall live how? By faith. And that's what the book of Hebrews elaborates. And in, in in that verse is quoted in all three. So there's, it's a very key thing worth, worthy of your study. But in any case, that leads him ultimately on October 31st of 1517... Luther nails his famed 95 Theses to the door at Wittenberg College. His dream, his hope, his ambition was to get the church to reform, to, to, to shed these pagan uh, practices. But the response is just the opposite. On December 10th of 1520, there's a bull excommunicating him unless he retracts within 60 days or death. And Luther burns it publicly, and the Reformation, in effect, is born. Now, the Diet of Worms in 1521, Charles V, the emperor of the so-called Holy Roman Empire, that would be Germany, Spain, Netherlands, and Austria, summoned Luther to appear, and he has his big climactic appearance. If he, if he doesn't recant, he's either going to kill him. He says, here I stand, I can do not else, so help me God. And that was fortunately because of the support of the German princes and so forth. They didn't kill him, obviously. And, but the century of wars began, the war on the German Protestants, the war in the process of the Netherlands, the wars, the Huguenot Wars in France, Philip's attempt against England. These are the, just a whole century of wars here. Thirty Years' War, as it's called. All were wars trying to stamp out or, or, or contail the so-called Reformation. So we have the Reformation popes. We've got Julius II, called the Warrior Pope. He's the richest of the cardinals with vast income from numerous bishops and uh, church estates. Uh, he bought the papacy, obviously, and he attained and personally led vast armies and, used, and issued indulgences for money. And that was part of what uh, uh, we have uh, uh, dealing with here with Leo the... the uh, he was Pope when Luther started the, the whole Protestant Reformation. And Luther, people argue he didn't really start it. He was just a precipitating event. There were a lot of things already going on in different parts of Europe. The, the, the Luther, Martin Luther thing was sort of is what caused it all to... to to move forward in a dramatic way. That's why they say the Reformation started with him. Technically, there are a lot of movements that already started in a number of places. But anyway, Leo X was made an archbishop when he was eight years old. And uh, he, uh, he became a uh, cardinal at 13. He held 27 offices before he was 13 years old. He appointed cardinals as young as seven. See, these were just the games they're playing, in a sense. Um, he maintained the most luxurious and licentious court in Europe, 
as a voluptuary, he uh, reaffirmed the unum sanctum, which is declared that every human being be subject to the Roman uh, pontiff for salvation. He used indulgences and for stipulated fees and declared the burning of heretics a divine appointment. So we, we get to Adrian and we get, uh, let's keep moving along here, Paul. Uh, the third had many illegitimate children. He was a determined enemy of the Protestants and he offered Charles V an army to, uh, to exterminate them. And we have the Jesuits that was, uh, they, they uh, based on a principle of unconditional obedience to the Pope having its object of recovery of territory lost to the Protestants and Muslims and the conquest of the entire heathen world for the Roman Catholic Church. Very militant group. Their supreme aim was the destruction of heresy that thinking anything different than what the Pope said to think. And uh, for this accomplishment, though, their ground rules are pretty broad. Anything was justifiable, deception, immorality, vice, even murder. In France, they were responsible for the St. Matthew's Massacre. I'll come to that in a minute. The persecution of the Huguenots, the revocation of the Tolerant Edict, and they even facilitated the French Revolution. In Spain, Netherlands, South Germany, Bohemia, Austria, Poland, and other countries, they, laid, they led in the massacre of untold multitudes and thus saved the papacy from ruin. St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine de' Medici, the mother of the existing king at the time, an ardent Romanist and willing tool of the Pope, she gave the order and on the night of August 24th of 1572, 70,000 Huguenots were massacred. There was great rejoicing in Rome. The Pope and his College of Cardinals went in solemn procession to the Church of San Marco and, and ordered the De Tuum to be sung in thanksgiving. They struck a medal in, commem com in commemoration of the massacre, sent a cardinal to Paris to, to bear the king and the queen mother the congratulations of the Pope. Strange times. Well, with that background, we had a very interesting thing occur on March 29th of 1994. All this apparently some kind of big misunderstanding. A joint declaration was signed called the Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. Uh, most, and this is, some people herald the most significant event in 500 years of church history. Is it? A difficult area. Some very prominent Christian leadership have joined in signing this, and an equal Equally impressive, in fact, maybe more impressive, group of Christian scholars are shocked because it's really a denial of the people that willingly went to, the bur to be burned at the stake for their belief in biblical doctrine. The compromise of the gospel lies at the heart of the agreement, and the gospel hasn't changed, and that's the problem. But there was a surprising announcement that you also should make part of the record here, and that's May 21st of 1995. The Pope himself, believe it or not, asked forgiveness for all the wrongs and crimes committed and permitted by the Roman Catholic Church throughout their history. It would have been a little more impressive if he asked forgiveness of what the Vatican perpetrated during the history, but he, he generalized it, and uh, at least that's a, a, you know, a, a stake in the ground. You say, Chuck, this is pretty wild stuff. You've been very offensive here. I'm sure some people are. I encourage you to do a little homework. One of the most accessible products you can get at any Christian bookstore is Haley's Bible Handbook. But uh, the one I use is the 24th edition, published in 1965. It originally published way back in 27. It's a classic. You can get it in any Christian bookstore. I might caution you, though, don't get the special edition that was handed out by Billy Graham because you'll discover this particular section was removed from that special printing run. So get, make sure you get the whole one and that, that'll have a history of the, of the Vatican thing. And uh, it'll give you the re references where you can check things out. Another way to deal with this su subject is to check out the book by Dave Hunt, A Woman Rides the Beast, published by Harvest House in 1994. It's, I, I regard it as a must-read for every serious Christian. There are some viewpoints that Dave holds that I don't happen to be quite in step with, but they're not material here. That uh, He's done an outstanding job at researching the background, and he, will, he has the thing documented thoroughly, so you can check it out. Dave and I did a briefing pack together here called The Kingdom of Blood, where we each spent, uh, did, did a session, and that's available here. But I recommend even better, while well, that's handy here, I, I recommend that Dave's book, go to any Christian bookstore and, and get it. If you can't get it... Uh, uh, you can get it on the net, whatever. Well, let's get to this prophetic profile. Remember we said that we had these various churches. Um, Ephesus was the apostolic church. Smyrna, the persecuted church. Pergamus is the married church. What do I call Thyatira? Well, for lack of another name, I'll just call it the medieval church. Are we together? That's, I think, a reasonable descriptor. Um, and again, we, we made note of the fact that if there's a change in architecture that has just occurred. And we're going to study that in the subsequent sessions, but I'll give you a, a glimpse in advance. If I take these churches 
and I take the various appellations on them. Thiath, we notice a couple of things. First of all, we notice that these first three had the promises to the overcomer postscripted. And the second group, the promises are in the body of the letter. If nothing else, it at least clusters these into two groups. It's interesting, too, that the last four each have an explicit reference to this, uh, of the coming of Christ. The first three do not, the last four do. So that's also a distinctive. Thyatira is distinctive in that there, it includes a threat that if they don't repent, they'll be thrust into the Great Tribulation. We're going to see one of the other three churches have just the opposite commitment made. And uh, we'll talk about that as we get to it. So that's just a foreglimpse. As we get through all seven, we'll backtrack and try to look at the, how these all fit together in an in a overall design. So let's talk about next session. I've run a little over time already, so let's read for next time. Read chapters 2 and 3. Read all, all seven letters. I think that's useful. But outline the next one, which is the letter to Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. And what is the, the Sardis? What is their primary need? It won't be as obvious until you, unless you study carefully. And find out what are, the dis, what, what are the distinctives of this particular letter. That's your assignment for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Tough stuff. A very difficult period of history to try to summarize briefly. Um, and let's remind ourselves that Jesus commended them, the church at Thyatira, for their works, their services, and so forth. There are some positives there. But he did emphasize this woman Jezebel and all that she represented. And uh, I think the parallels to us seem very, very obvious. How does it affect you and me? How does it affect you and me? That's the challenge. Because he that hath any life hear what the Spirit says to the church is. There are lessons here. Independent, independent of the church you happen to attend personally. It has to do with our personal walk with the Lord and our, our forbearance of paganism in whatever form we find it. Our forbearance of immorality, sexual and spiritual immorality. That's the issue all the way through. And immorality always goes hand in hand, sexual and idolatrous together. It caused the church to stumble. It caused Solomon to stumble, the wisest man on the earth. Started off great, but became apostate at the end because of sexual immorality and um, false worship. Our hearts. Father, we come before your throne awed that you have loved us so much as to give us your son, Jesus Christ. And yet, Father, if we stand back and look at history, we just grieve, just grieve at the miserable, resp miserable response that, on balance, we collectively have made. We thank you, Father, that nevertheless that you've given us your Son. We thank you, Father, that you've brought us to this point in time. We pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit for discernment and understanding. And yes, resolve. We do pray, Father, that you would help us understand what you would have of us where you have planted us. We pray, Father, that you'd give us the strength and the equipping to hold fast to be strong as your ambassadors. Keep us from being married to the world, Father. Help us to never forget that we're just passing through. We're pilgrims here. For we look for a city whose maker is you. Father, we would just pray that you would help each of us to grow in grace the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to shed the grave clothes of the past. Help us to step forward, untrammeled, unhindered by the traditions and the missteps of the past. Help us, Father, to be your ambassadors. Help us to be fruitful stewards. 
as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation. As we come to you in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen.